Thanks, Julia. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to support this group of emerging talented writers from Grub Street, where I've taught for a number of years now. Um, as Julia mentioned, I was, am, the grateful recipient of a Boston Artist Fellowship in 2020. This fellowship came with the opportunity to do a public event of some kind, and then COVID happened. So when Julia let me know that it would be possible to do an online event, I reached out to some of my fellow instructors at Grub Street and asked them to nominate their best students, and here they are. They'll each be reading a piece of work, and in the end, we'll have some time for discussion. And before I go on to introduce our first leader, uh, our first reader, let me just say again, thank you, Julia. Um, and I'm so grateful to you and to the Boston Mayor's Office for this fellowship opportunity and for all the ways that you support and encourage the arts in Boston. So our first reader will be Charlotte Bellamy. She writes grants and nonprofit communications by day and short fiction by night. She studied political and environmental sciences at Wake Forest University and is currently based in North Carolina. Hi everyone, this piece is untitled, so I'm just gonna jump right in. We arrive by propeller plane, its hollow bones shudder beneath our seats, making the woman in the next row cower like a pearl into her man. Their bodies, each so attentive to the other, say honeymoon. Meanwhile, my ego swells at being the sort of woman who doesn't require an oyster. A handful of islands appear below like lost freckles, so close together that the Caribbean separating them is just a tangle of rivers. He gave me the window seat, so I try to say things like, look, and wow. But my eyes, I keep trained on the jungle our plane now lowers into. We deboard to swamp heat and ocean wind. The taxi we hail is a spare wooden benched boat, a brightly painted hull with a motor trailing behind and a driver whose flip flops are worn to the ground in the centers. We buy the $2 passage to the next island, a 40 minute journey. At times we idle in the shallow spots where the boat might otherwise clip the corals and at others we lurch at terrifying speed through low tunnels of mangrove. I think I feel romantic when we duck our heads together. His name is David. He's so tall that his walk's funny, all spring and bone. His black hair grows too long towards sun damaged shoulders. We arrived together at the jungle as a precarious vessel, newly sprouting cracks. When he asked me to come away with him, I could tell he thought it might seal the cracks. And as his pitches wore on, I found that I thought it was a good idea too if only because I wanted to drop the vessel entirely and see if it survived the fall. Where the driver finally beaches the boat in the shallows of a deserted shore, an unsmiling young couple waits for us, standing side by side like American Gothic. The driver leaps out without waiting and tromps through calf high water to the sand where he embraces the man. David and I follow shyly, cuffing and then wetting the cuffs of our jeans. The woman approaches us. I'm Donna, she says in American English. She helps us hold our tall backpacks above the water and then prop them into the empty beach. We'll have to give them a minute, she adds with a nod. They're old neighbors, and it's rare that Armelio's old friends stop by. When the driver finally leaves us, it's with only a small wave for Donna. And so we walk from the beach up a steep hill and arrive at last at their farm, a green clearing, a crop of cabin-like structures, and beyond that, the whole of the tropics. In the falling dark, we sit among the pile of our things on the low porch that encircles our new employer's home. Of course, there are insects singing and hunting, and behind us, the jungle sings too, awake in such a way that I wish I didn't sit with my back to it. Finca Presita doesn't grow strawberries at all. You'll see, says Donna. There are so many red frogs that they cover the plants like strawberries you'll want to pluck them off and eat them. Well, there used to be, Ormelio clarifies, evading the glance of his wife who carries on undeterred. And in the morning, I'll show you my way to the water, the scenic way. Ormelio's way skips past all the good parts. She is easy, leaned back, teacup perennially on its way to her mouth like all gravity leads there. She leaves the practical information to Ormelio he speaks with an accent and a hurry, like he is unused to being the talker in the room. 
He explains the laundry schedule, how the kitchen depends on all of us to keep the suds and the rinse bins separate, how we should have rubber boots. Do we have rubber boots? Good, then we should leave them on the black mat and enter th through the back door when it's raining. There are more sinister things too, cab plate numbers to know and never to hail, streets not to walk at night, currents to look for and not to swim in, but I forget to listen. It is difficult to focus when I'm so disoriented by the journey, the sudden night, and now the sweating in the dark across from this strange couple who still haven't mentioned their son. Some instinct for the familiar keeps me glancing left at David, checking, is he still beside me? But there is no need. The answer can be felt in my peripherals where I feel his gaze landing with the teacup on the mouth of Donna. The thing about one person being sure than the other in a relationship is that it's like paddling a boat. The uneven effort sends you only in circles. In this way, we've circled the same waters that troubled me so much in the first place for a very long time. But here he was, still my hopeful, still that first person to pick me up just to drive the first to show me the way it felt to be someone's someone. And even if we are as threadbare as this new country, a tendon straining to hold the two Americas together, this land is fertile. So I try to remember saying, okay, let's do it. And David hooting, scooping me into gangling arms, unready to hold anything like an infant. Thanks, Charlotte. Oh, I want to be in a jungle now. <laughs> All right, next we have Fran Cronin, who moved with her two children from Moscow, Russia to Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1998. After receiving her master's in journalism from Harvard, she pivoted to fiction writing and in 2020 was invited to participate in the Disquiet International Literary Program in Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Shuba, Grub Street, and the Mayor's Boston uh, Cultural Office for this opportunity. The name of my piece is Baptism. Under the faucet of a stained porcelain tub, my mother scrubbed my white skin pink with her determined hands. I arched my back and squinted my eyes as I braced for the warm water to wash over my face and down my naked body until my skin glistened and my hair squeaked clean. In the backyard of the house where I grew up on a flat square of lawn between twin oak saplings, my father erected a three foot high vinyl swimming pool. And from a top floor window, I looked down to watch my two brothers and their three friends, almost men body boys, ribs heaving beneath their muscled sleek skin as they climbed up the five steps of the pool's wooden ladder and from the top platform, hurl themselves in a tight cannonball into the flat sky blue water. With mouths agape from pain or thrill or both, they burst to the surface in an explosion of water, crystal tipped from the overhead sun. One night in the summer of my 16th year, I lay together with my young lover on night cooled sand under a yellow strip of moonlight that stretched from our bare toes to where the sky and sea were one. I turned my face to his, sand sticking to the corner of my mouth as the molecules of our hot breaths wafted back and forth, in and out, as the undulating ripples of the sea, like eager lips, sought the moon's shimmering light. On a day when all I could see and feel was the frothing sea and gusts of cold spray stung my face, you asked me to marry you. The sails were reefed and hollowed out and the keel healed, massed to water as we crested and skidded through the Gulf Stream's 15 foot swells. Below deck, steadying myself against the lurching sea, you helped me pull on my yellow foul weather gear, overalls, boots, and sou'wester hat before I took the helm to navigate us through the warring warm and cold currents of the heaving Atlantic Ocean. One summer in Maine, 
when our daughter was three, she insisted on swimming around a wooden dock that jutted into the depths of a brackish bay. She strapped, strapped in her red life jacket, a buoyant torso with pipe cleaner legs and arms. She jumped into the water so cold it left her gasping. I followed her in, her face a chattering beacon against the liquid opaque green as she doggy paddled from piling to piling through the small swells of North Water Current. When out of the bay, you took a picture of her standing on the dock, her lips a quavering blue line. As water dripped off her shivering body and pooled around her bare feet, gulls overhead swooped and squawked. The night you left me many years later and after our daughter was no longer three, I stripped out of my clothes and into the shower stream of hot water. I scrubbed my skin raw, but I couldn't wash you off me. We have a water theme tonight. Um, the flow of, you know, both the water and the time, something I'm feeling. Thank you, Fran. Next, we have Michal Godrez. Michal grew up in Amherst, Massachusetts and graduated from Emerson College with honors and a BFA in film production. They have worked as a sexual health educator in Brookline and will be pursuing an MFA in fiction at Portland State University in the fall. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm going to be reading a poem titled Medusa. It would be Zeus who would come for me, I thought, as a swan, talons digging into my hips and bright beak at my neck. I told myself I would pluck his feathers with my teeth, eat them while he was on top of me, that I would gain something from consuming the power of a god. She is often described as golden, but Athena is bright, white, hot lightning. And when she says the word beautiful, it is not like a flower, but like a sword, sharp, gleaming, reflecting her vanity. I was the only mirror allowed in her temple. I begged her once to stop it, or else why tell me? Why did she? She told me gods are beholden to the fates as much as they are beholden to anyone, beholden a word like her arms on my waist and the sweet slip of nectar between my fingers, and then her hands, which are so much bigger than mine, were all over me again, and her mouth, which always tasted a bit like blood. I was beloved of Athena, after all. I thought she would come down in her armor with her spear. Even when I thought it would be Zeus, I dreamed of her standing guard against her father, my warrior goddess, big as the sky, as my shield. Later, after all this happens, when all of it has happened, when she sends Perseus to kill me, I will try to remember who I was before a goddess loved me. There were parents, I think, there must have been, and two sisters whose names I can't recall. I think she did that, taught me to begin with the moment she loved me, so that like her who began fully formed stepping from her father's head, I would exist only as an extension of a god. I was alone in her temple, sweeping the floor, a normal thing, domestic. It wasn't Zeus, but Poseidon, fish scales sliding under my nails when he, and his smell like murk, like whales and sea foam, slippery and salt. I tried to bite down on those scales, tear one away between my teeth like a feather to eat it. But fish scales aren't soft like feathers, and nothing ever happens the way you imagine. She found me on the floor, still, my scalp bleeding from when I struggled, from when he wrapped his fingers through my hair, ripping it from the roots, even the gray ones that Athena liked because they reminded her of metal. The way she looked at me, Athena always looked like ambrosia sounds pouring over tongues, her smell like the savory of burning flesh spiced, but now she was angry and I could see the lightning in her eyes, a storm. They had desecrated her temple and her priestess who was her mirror and a part of the temple. I wanted to tell her, you could have stopped this. I wanted to tell her I was still drowning continuously, waterlogged, shivering. I wanted her to swear never again, and she did. 
She left me there, still gathering my torn clothes, my hands bloody, my hair on the floor, which I had been sweeping, tufts in my fingers. She returned with a cup of wine drugged with herbs, strange ones. I could smell them. I didn't care. Drink, she said. The changing wasn't as bad as what had come before. My back splitting open like a tree, struck by lightning, my hair growing back, heavy and thick with braids, I thought, and everything inside me seemed to sharpen. When I looked up, Athena's face was turned from me, her head tilted slightly down, a strange posture, almost supplication, unfamiliar on her who always stood so tall and proud. What did you do? Her eyes were closed, the liquid light of them confined. I saw her face clearly for the first time, vulnerable like a lover, a mortal one, almost. I wanted to touch her. She gave me wings to escape with, and the snakes, I knew by then, the hissing at my ears, tongues darting by my cheek, a caress to protect me. I thought how useful they would have been. They would have bitten him, eaten his eyes if he got too close. But more, she gave me power, my face like a god's distilled. No one could look at me, even you. She doesn't want to become a statue in her own temple carved of stone. Gods lack imagination, I told her. I could speak to her now. When the past, I would drown in her eyes before my tongue recalled itself. I tore some of my robe, the dirtied cloth on the floor at my feet, shook off loose strands of my old hair, rootless. It smelled hot where he had touched it, like seawater. I stood on my toes, reaching, winding the fabric like a crown around her eyes. There, I said. Her face, puzzled, turned toward my voice. So I kissed her, with my eyes open, which I had never done before. Ancient Greece, but so, so here. Thank you, Michal. Next, we have Daniel Motzinger. Daniel received his BFA in creative writing and literature from Emerson College in 2005. His first story was published this spring at fictionsoutheast.com. Shuva, hello everyone. This is a short story called Knots. The way you do it isn't like they did. I volunteer my hands to you which you position behind my back before looping rope around them. The first time I was tied up was my final weekend as a scout. Two of them forced me against a tree, while a third restrained my hands with thick brown rope that bristled and pricked. Your rope is synthetic, cool, and smooth. It's electric blue. You tease ticklish gasps out of me as you thread the rope between my pale inner thighs and up my buttocks. They weren't concerned that the rope cut into my wrists. They didn't whisper into my ears to ask if I was comfortable. They didn't silence or gag me. They held sticks like bats, inviting me to shout so that they could take a swing. My family was moving after the summer and my entire childhood was darkened by the belief that I'd never make it out of there alive. If I'd called for help that night, I wouldn't have. What would fall out of me if they made me their pinata? Would they stomp the foil wrapped pieces of me to bits, kick them away? bury them in some creature's scat. I knew they wouldn't collect and cherish them. My diaphragm pushes my tummy in and out of the framework work rope. I'm on my knees and you tug the expansive rope along my spine, the path connecting my shoulders and legs. Now your feet. You bite the words into my neck and lay me face down on the bed. They meant to deliver me to the earth. They spit in my eyes and squeezed my throat. They called me faggot, girl, and wolf food. They said all I had to do to be freed was to cry out for release, and they'd give it to me. They'd give me a darkness and peace like heaven once their work was done. After tying my feet together and kissing each one in the center of the arch where I'm most ticklish, your skin disconnects from mine. The harness slackens and the bed's pressure announces your exit. I turn to watch you leave the bedroom. Alone, my body clenches the way it did then. When they realized nothing would make me call for help, they dropped their sticks and disappeared into the night. I spared myself from a bludgeoning, but my voice remained frozen. I learned early on how to stand my ground against men, but I still struggle to trust them. So I roll over onto my back and I gaze at the ceiling like I once gazed into a dark forest. 
I imagine you dressing and departing and that I'll be devoured by wolves. At the first slice of dawn, the one who tied the rope returned. He didn't speak as he untied me and I didn't thank him for doing so. He put the rope in my hands, a reminder for a keepsake. Back at camp, I maneuvered past the other scouts to my sleeping bag, careful not to rouse the nest of dreaming rattlesnakes. I zipped myself within the bag and held the ropes close to my chest. The bedroom door opens and your face enters my view. You put your mouth on mine and your breath is fresh like spearmint. You ask if I was worried you left and I lie, no. You flip me back over the way you'd left me. Your fingers grip the rope around my waist and tug me backward. Next there are lips followed by stubble, wetness and shivers. I don't know what to expect next, but every sensation overwrites that night in the woods. You aren't the first and you won't be the last. I have always been restrained, but I've learned how to live with it. Every time someone like you ties me up, I'm more and more grateful that I didn't cry out that night. What they did to me is a piece of me for you to unwrap and place upon your tongue. Thank you. Violence and beauty. Thanks, Daniel. Next, we have Corinna Renee. Her writing career began as a student in the University of Southern California's screenwriting program. She writes in English, Spanish, and Japanese and has been published in the online version of the Venezuelan newspaper, El Nacional. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm going to read a piece of a short story called Battle Scars. My dad was a hummingbird aficionado. He loved the way their turquoise bellies hovered over the periwinkle flowers of the giant crepe myrtle trees by the abandoned bodega. I hated them. They were like skittish, oversized insects carrying inauspicious omens on their fluttering wings. My mom said I was too suspicious. I reminded her of one, when one flew in our apartment the first time we ate shawarma from a dumpster. We got diarrhea and hadn't saved enough water to flush the toilet during the drought. Neighbors started delivering buckets to pour down our toilet so that the complex wouldn't smell like a sewer. Then there was the time one hovered in front of me right before my cousin launched a Molotov cocktail towards a tank during a protest. It fell a meter in front of me, scalding my elbow as I shielded my face with my forearm. I was a freshman in high school at the time. Even now, as a senior, I still have the scar. So when a hummingbird intruded onto my gated tennis court in my Manhattan Beach High School, I knew trouble was on the way. I was jogging around the hidden court alone as students pounded tennis balls in the cloaked playing field surrounding me. I didn't want anyone to see me. Just a few months before, I'd been in Caracas where food shortages had my family living hungrier than a lice on a teddy bear. I was recovering from malnutrition, my winded attempts of getting back in shape embarrassed me. The hummingbird fled. Melody, a mammoth of a senior from my world history class stepped in. Her six foot shadow cast a chill over the dry noonday heat. Two of her friends stood watch outside the gate as she shut it behind her. You ready to pay me what you owe me? Melody asked. My scholarship was privately funded, I said. It didn't come from your parents' taxes, so I don't owe you anything. Even if it had, my parents pay taxes too, along with a bunch of other people, so technically it still wouldn't be your money. Milky white knuckles curved towards my chin. I wanted to dodge them, but my reflexes didn't cooperate. The fence rattled as I fell against it. My mouth throbbed. I checked for loose teeth with the tip of my tongue still solid. Was my lip busted? The liquid spilling down my chin said it had to be. I waited, listening for the rhythm of bouncing balls and thudding rackets on the occupied courts next door to stop. Surely someone had heard us. They would grab a teacher or offer help themselves. The games continued. I'm giving you to the end of the day, Melody said. Then what'll happen, I said. You'll really beat my ass? I'm pretty versatile, Vasily. I have other methods, but some prefer violence. She left. I caught a smirk from one of her friends as they headed back into the school. I slid down the fence and rested on the ground. I needed advice. I didn't have in-person friends, but I had about 2,000 buddies subscribed to my YouTube channel, Annalisa in 30 seconds. I grabbed my phone camera, scanning the court before landing on my battered face. 
Second week of school, I said, just got in a fight. I lost. Obviously, I pointed to my lip. The bully who did this wants money. To pay or not to pay? That is my question. Any advice? You can share in the comments below. My finger lingered over the upload button. I worried what my parents would think. If I didn't post the video, I could tell them I face planted in gym class. That way they wouldn't worry. That way they think our new North American life was just as glossy as we dreamed, full of peaceful streets and plenteous meals, no angst or threats of violence. <laughs> I laughed at myself. No way my parents would believe that. My dad used to be a political prisoner. We knew the face of a beating like a populist knew the look of a vulnerable crowd. I posted the video. A few minutes later, I had my first comments. Max, triple X, 69, 69. Payer, no more bruises on that pretty face. Kiss emoji. Freedom fighter, 12, 12. What school do you go to? I'll help you fight. The second comment brightened my mood. I imagined a bully fighting coalition. We would be the goon crushers, the noble nerds, the anti-bullies. My optimism reminded me of my father's positivity the day of his first beating. Thanks, Karina. You've taken on that challenge of um, layering you know, the real world and the virtual. Next, we have Luis Enrique Rodia, who is a Boston-based writer and poet born in Havana, Cuba. He grew up in Miami, Florida after immigrating with his family to the United States in childhood. His stories have been awarded second place and honorable mention in Glimmer Train, and he will be pursuing an MFA at the University of Oregon in the fall. Thank you, Shuba, and thank you to the Boston Mayor's Office. Thank you, everyone. I'll be reading from a short story called Hunter Gatherer. On spring mornings, we hunted for mangoes. The trees were wild with them in their seasons, dozens of sunset red bundles suspended on ropey stems over a muddy yard enclosed between the rear of our school building and a mildewed fence guarding the grove on the other side. The strongest boys among us, fitting challenges at who would knock down the most fruit, would search the ground for stones heavy and mobile enough to bring down birds in flight, while the weakest, myself included, prepared to stand by cautiously underneath the branches for their kill to fall. When we first arrived that morning under a light shower, many of the mangoes had already fallen, most bursting and easy to pick off the ground. But aside from a little dirt, which could be washed in the rain, gathering these was cowardly, and the other boys would knock out of our hands anything we didn't catch ourselves. In any case, even taking them when no one was looking was risky, as there were large armies of red ants on the ground defending their colonies. Climbing was also not an option. A year prior, one of the more gifted among us got clever and decided to climb the fence in order to reach the high fruit of one of the larger trees. And yeah, sure, he got there all right, fluidly navigated his way between the ant colonies, skated the fence and grabbed hold of one of the thick branches from which drooped a delicious bunch, but it was short-lived. As soon as he touched the fruit, a half-rotten mango flew from the grove on the other side and struck him on the temple, startling him and bringing him down on the ants below. We tried our best to save him, but we took too long and the beasts had their way. Though not fatally injured, he spent two weeks out of class. When he returned, the boys started calling him Lazaro. He rarely hunted with us again, despite his valiant spirit, but he had helped us discover something no one had ever mentioned. There was someone keeping watch, someone we could not see, could do nothing about, and they knew about us. And whoever this was, whoever owned the roots of the trees on the other side of the mildewed fence, preferred letting dozens of mangoes rot on the ground each spring, their sweet odor oppressing our empty stomachs daily in our classrooms through the glassless windows which looked out into the muddy yard, than let any of us eat from the fruit. It was then we decided we could make do with the rainy days when it was less likely we would have to deal with our mystery assailant keeping watch. Not everyone was happy with this decision and the group shrank by half. This, of course, meant more mangoes for us. And when school lunch was a serving of rice and stowaway maggots, mangoes were a glory which those of us always starving were glad to hunt for, even in the rain. Radnar, tall and fleshy, was the best of us after Lazaro's fall. When he wasn't busy having his home brought breakfast, he would join us, if only to show off how easily he could take down a full bunch of mangoes on a single throw. 
after which, filled with cheer, he'd walk away disinterested in fruit. Following a trip abroad, however, his father brought him a slingshot, which he first used as glamour and finally as terror. The rest of us had only our hands and teeth. And so when Radnar showed up that rainy morning and ordered me to stand under the largest, most crimson bunch we had ever seen, I obeyed. After looking around and slapping at my boots to make sure no ants were crawling on them, I pulled on my white shirt and held it open underneath the large red bunch. Eyes clamped, I turned my head sideways so the fruit would fall down even. The rain had grown thicker and cold and my hands began to shake. I was not afraid Radnar would miss. Then again, there had been that birthday party a few months before when he had brought out all his foreign toys for us to drool over and I'd somehow insulted his favorite, a crawling GI that made firing noises whenever the tip of its rifle lit up. When I asked him what kind of batteries it used, he must have realized it would eventually die since they were hard to find. Face blushing, he kicked me out of the party and things went sour from then on. But no, Radnar did not miss. In fact, it was the straightest shot anyone had ever taken. Even in the swelling rain, thwacking the leaves, we heard it slice the air and strike hard. The other boys boomed and then gasped suddenly. I opened my eyes, but before I could react, an entire branch of the tree had come down, water and all, landing me knelt in the mud, soaked. The branch had swiped me on the left, but I did not feel myself badly hurt. Radnar walked over and stood near me, disappointed. He held the bundle in his hand for a moment before throwing it down at my feet and walking away, cheeks flushed. When I picked it off the ground, I saw it, a flock of worn, deflated red balloons, which must have been trapped in the trees for ages. I stared blankly at the crimson bundle in my hands. I had never held balloons before. Thank you. Being from India, I miss mangoes so much. I feel like mangoes were a, or the mango was a character in your story there. Takes me back. Thanks, Luis. Next, we have Ning Sullivan, a researcher with advanced degrees in philosophy and sociology. She grew up in mainland China. She learned to speak English at age 36 when she came to the United States and has been writing stories in that language for the past 10 years. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming. This is a, from a short fiction called Mitsujiwa. She's going to tell him today when he comes home from work. To calm her nerves, she's making a flower arrangement. She had practiced Ikebana for years, but stopped after her mantle, Miss Yamaguchi, died. The autumn sun is high and bright. She sits at the Taigo Maple dining table with her implements lined up neatly. Kanzans, shears, wiles, reference books, and a sharpened pencil. Planning to make a traditional Swiss species shoka, she gathered materials during her early morning walk along the marsh bright yellow goldenrod, a few stems of reeds, and dainty blue New England aster. The flowers look fresh and plump after their stems have been submerged in a bucket of water, the whole morning. She feels confident about the arrangements emerging in her mind. Reeds will be the center element. The shing goldenrod will be the support showing its own beautiful line, the sui. The aster would be the tie representing the energy of the young. It usually takes her a long time to decide what to use for what. Queen of indecisiveness, she calls herself, not entirely self-deprecating. Today, she's decisive. Anxious, yes, but not indecisive. She's going to tell him she has decided. She chooses the three long stems of reeds, cuts them to two and a half times the height of the base and then inserts them in the middle of the kanzen. The supple reeds stand tall and bend slightly sideways. She fiddles with the length and the angle until she's satisfied. She likes rules, always has. Her parents raised her on the principle that if you follow rules and work hard, you get ahead in life and everything will be okay. She had no trouble making decisions until, until she came to the United States. The rules here are different, and there are a few of them. What surprised her was that with freedom come choices. 
she become more and more indecisive and anxiety has followed. That's why she decided to go with the Ikanabo Ikabana. It's five centuries of history has generated so many rules, intricate and interwoven. The results is the harmony and the understated beauty. Outside, two squirrels are darting around under the oak tree. She cannot tell if they are just praying or gathering acorns. Last year, there were few acorns. This year, they are abundant. Covering that part of the lawn, she vaguely recalls there's correlation between acorns and snow. Season the change and natural order. Maybe her marriage is merely at a low point, a part of ebb and flow of a normal relationship. Her tea is cold, but she doesn't want to heat more water. She sips the bitter green tea. She cuts two stems of garden rod to the proper lens and inserts them behind the reeds, toward the left at a 45 degree angle. Then she cuts the cluster of aster to the lens of one third of the reeds and inserts in the front, angled away to the right. Now all three materials are in. She admires the contrast and complements of the materials in shape, color, and texture. She has always liked the three species shoka, its balance and richness. Perhaps no child is the problem. Three legs make a surface stable. A marriage without a child is incomplete, is it? She should have insisted. Plenty of couples have children in their 40s, or they could have adopted. He would never go for it, but she should have tried. Yes, you can make a two species arrangement, but it's lacking. She's going to tell him today, she must, after dinner. Dinner tonight is a rack of lamb with jasmine rice and sauteed spinach. She spent the morning preparing, trimming the fat and wrapping the ends of the bones with a tinfoil so they weren't burned. She mixed olive oil, mustard seeds and mixed garlic into the seasoning paste. Dessert is ginger flavored creme brulee, already chilling in rankings. The only thing left is to spring sugar on top and scotch it to a crack finish with the kitchen bowl touch. This last part is his job, always. They are a good team, people say. She hears the rumble of the garage door going up. Uh, hearing that reminded me of, you know, what fiction can do. Like if we just had a camera on your character, we'd just see a woman alone. Um, but your words give her this inner life that's so vast. Thank you, Ning. And our last reader is Grace Tatter. She's a freelance journalist and fiction writer. She's worked as a producer at the, on, at the national radio show On Point. And she's a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Thank you. Um, this story is called Southern Hospitality. The morning after she gives her first blowjob, she wakes up just after six. She feels embarrassed. She doesn't think she gave an especially good blowjob. She also feels exhilarated as if she's accomplished something she's been working toward for a long time. She slips into her dress and out of the boys' dorm room. The sun is already bright over still deserted London streets, but she can get home before her flatmates wake up. They are all upperclassmen at the large state school she attends back home, all unknown to her before moving into a small apartment in Clerkenwell for a summer Shakespeare course. Part of her is proud to have already met someone, even if he's just another American from another big state school. And part of her is ashamed to have been out all night or maybe it's just residual shame from the probably not especially good blowjob. She could transfer trains and get off at Farringdon, but she looks forward to the walk from the Angel Stop down the posh Islington High Street. She already knows the way from the station to her flat without looking at a map. She hopes passersby might confuse her for a native, not that there are many passersby at this hour. Just outside the Angel Station, a man stops and asks her directions to Farringdon Road. He has a non-British accent, Italian maybe, Spanish. His hair is dark with a few gray hairs at the temples. He could be 30 or he could be 45. It doesn't matter. She still thinks in terms of people above a certain age as grown-ups. 
She does know the way, she answers, trying to hide her excitement. It only requires two turns, directions that don't necessarily denote fluency in London streets. Still, she is proud. He thanks her and they start heading in the same direction. Do you mind if I walk with you? He asks. There are shopkeepers cranking open storefronts, a few cars passing by. She shrugs and smiles. Not at all. Do you live around here? He says, you don't sound English. I'm not, she says. American? She nods. I hope you don't mind me saying, he says, but you are very beautiful. She looks more closely at him. He's wearing pants and a sweater, even though it's summer, very European. She wonders if he can tell what she did last night. She knows from the bathroom mirror back in the dorm that her eyeliner is still on, just a little smudge. She's wearing a dress with sailboats on it. It's short, but it doesn't scream walk of shame. It's Sunday morning. For all he knows, she's walking to church. She decides to take his comment about her beauty as nothing more than a compliment. It feels very continental of him to immediately comment on her appearance, not as creepy as it would be from an older man at home. You don't sound British either, she says. Italian, he confirms. I'm here for work. Where are you from in the States? Georgia. Ah, the South, he says. Gone with the wind, the Civil War. Yep, she says, that's us. The boy from last night loved the way she said y'all when she asked him and his friends where they were from. All she's ever wanted is to leave Georgia, but she had leaned into it. During the blowjob, she had paused and said, I'm not going to have sex sex with you. And she hoped that her southerness made the declaration seem more sweet and wholesome than annoying and withholding. You lost, the Italian says. The Civil War? Yeah, she says. Good thing, too. He laughs. They walk a few more blocks. He asks her if it snows in Georgia, what people there think about President Obama. You're so much kinder than British girls, he tells her. Are all women from Georgia like this? I suppose it's a thing. Southern hospitality and all that, she says. She reciprocates with a few polite questions about where he's from. She mainly looks straight ahead to make sure that she recognizes where to turn, but occasionally she makes eye contact to show that yes, she is listening. They get to our block. She stops and so does he. He puts his hands in his pockets. Well, this is my turn, but you just need to walk down this road for maybe two more blocks and then you'll hit Farringdon, she says. I will walk with you, he says. I enjoy our talk. Oh, she says, okay. The flat is just a block off the main road. She doesn't have anything else to say to him, but it's only a block. The street where she's staying is narrow and he veers slightly closer to her. It was nice meeting you, she says, when she gets to the front door, digging through her purse for her key fob. When she looks up, he pushes her against the wall and shoves his tongue in her mouth. For a second, she is frozen. It's 7 a.m. on a Sunday. There's no one on the side street. Before she even feels scared, she feels foolish. She pushes him off. He doesn't fight her. Sorry, she says, flustered, touching the fob to the keypad and then slamming the door behind her. She runs up the stairs and into the flat. She knows he has probably already left, but she feels as if she's being chased. Her flatmate, Chelsea, is sitting cross-legged on the couch with a bowl of cereal. She explains what just happened. She's out of breath. Chelsea looks angry and that anger feels right. She's angry too. How dare he? But then Chelsea speaks. You led him here? She feels embarrassed. Or maybe it's just residual shame from the blowjob. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. And thanks all of you. That was great. Um, and Grace, your story, you know, made me think of travel once more and, you know, meeting, going to different places, meeting people from different states, different countries. So I think that's a great transition um, to our discussion. And, you know, I would love um, for all of you, you know, writers to, you um, you know, share a little bit about what this past year has been like. It's been a very unusual year. Um, what it's been like for you, you know, as writers, what it's meant, um, you know, for your, for your reading and writing lives and what you're looking forward to or dreading as we're coming out of it. And I hope when I say that we're coming out of it, that those are not, you know, famous last words. <laughs> Who'd like to go first and then I'll, I'll back away and, you know, you can call on each other. I'll Thanks, Luis. I'll start, yeah. So, I mean, uh, with, with uh, COVID and this past year, there were, kind of, there were kind of two sides of this coin 
the sudden isolation, like the sudden everything closing. Uh, I was used to the isolation, but it's more as a choice as a writer. And, you know, when you read and a lot of isolation and then you could always go out and encounter the world again, especially here in Boston, where you could probably ride the train and hear like eight different languages from here to the library, you know, from like uh, I, I live in Brighton. So from like Brighton to the library. But um, and and then all of that was suddenly gone. The library was basically closed. The bookstores were closed. You know, all of that was gone. Um, and as far as it opening up again, uh, it's great. There's, there's definitely, I, I, I'm definitely anxious about moving to the other side of the country. So that in itself is, but it's also a great challenge because I, you know, I get to continue writing and I get to, you know, learn, sort of learn how to be again in a totally different place. <laughs> I'm excited to go out into the world and write in coffee shops again, because that was always my thing. It was always like, go on a day off, sit with the novel, with the notebook, and just keep getting refills of iced coffee until I'm jittering and I'm able to sit there. Because with when COVID started, that was the thing that was, you know, terrible in the sense of, oh, I can't go do these things, right? But at the same time, it was... I was a restaurant industry worker for many, many years. And so I was on furlough for the greater part of the last year. And, you know, it's a very scary time to be in. So it was like, well, we can sit here anxiously fretting day to day, or we can throw ourselves into the thing that we're always complaining about never doing, which is I'm always complaining about not having enough time to write. So having almost a whole year to just be in Grub Street classes constantly and to write and to see that pile of like drafts stack up was really phenomenal. And if there was one thing that I've, I'm now dreading, it's like losing all of that extra time that I, I did have to write. But um, it's also motivating because it's the goal to get back to that point where that's all you have to do again, you know, where you can just write and send things out and be around other writers. I mean, that's the biggest luxury was we weren't in a room, you know, in the Steinway piano building together, but the majority of my time over the past year was spent on Zoom with other people doing the same thing. And that was what made it a really great time, despite everything that was going on in the world. Yeah, wouldn't it have been great to like have all that time to discover or reconnect with the things that we always wished we had time for without the sickness? Um, yeah, M Michal, um, and then Fran. Yeah, I similar. I think what's so incredible is that the switch to Zoom classes really opened up the ability to join so many more classes that I normally am able to do. You know, I'm working in one place and if you get out after five, like no, no, normally I'm not going to sign up for a class that's on the other side of Boston at six and be able to get there and, you know, but with Zoom, you come home, you can do it. And I think the fact that so many places have shifted to this has been incredible. I took classes over the last year um, with uh, organizations in California, with organizations at Grub Street, with organizations in Western Mass, and I would not have been able to do that otherwise. So I think it definitely opened up something really, really cool, and that I do hope that something of that digital version continues, even as the other option, uh, the in-person option becomes possible again. Um, and I agree with people, I think isolation forces you to decide what you're going to spend your time with. I picked up Ovid's Metamorphoses during quarantine and my piece was based on on that and I decided, you know, what are we going to do with our time and and it got me reading more in a way that's sometimes hard when you're you know, caught up in life. So, I think there was a lot of benefits um and a lot of things that it'll be important to try and carry forward as as other stuff returns to normal. Um, I'm just going to add on what some people have already alluded to that uh, by not being by not having the uh, excuses to go out and the distractions, we are forced to be in our homes, be with ourselves. And I definitely developed the habit of writing 
during that time, which I, I didn't really have the time to do that before. And also I was in a program that provided that kind of structure. So it, it worked in tandem and it was, it was, it worked really well for me. I'm hoping I can sustain that discipline and practice because now that we're out and the piece that I read tonight, I did write that during COVID. And I also started a bunch of other pieces. So it was a fertile time. And um, my hope is that now that we can actually meet our fellow writers that we and also be in the new space at Grub at some point, that we'll continue building on our community. Um, I agree with uh, what's been said before, like especially Daniel and then Fran, I really like the term fer fertile. It makes me think of fertilizer, which is what this year has been to my writing. Um, usually when I write, um, I write to process pain or to process situations and things that I don't, can't wrap my head around. So this year there was a lot of writing to process a lot of things. Um, and also with that additional time, I spent a lot of time writing, but also on the flip side, my writing community deepened because I usually write on my own, but um, when the Zoom classes opened up, I was able to meet writers who were invested in their writing on the other side of the state um, or on the other side of the country um, who I didn't have access to beforehand. So yeah, this last year has been definitely a deepening year for my writing. Similarly to what a lot of folks have said, I learned to be alone this year, which is important if you're gonna write. Um, but I also had access to workshops for the first time. I don't really live in a part of the state or the country that has a lot of this. So I had access to workshops for the first time and basically learned to edit. And I look back now and I, I now think editing is writing and it's crazy to think that a year ago it's not really something I engaged in but I needed a community to show me like this is what writing looks like when you enter it into a conversation um, which has just been so cool and in that way I'm really grateful for the last year. Um, so I actually had a, maybe a slightly different experience than other people. Initially, the pandemic was not at all fertile or productive for my writing. I couldn't write at all because it felt like so much of writing is grounded in your specific experience. And for the first time ever, we were all going through this collective horrible thing that it was like, what could I possibly say that one of the other billions of people going through this right now isn't going to say, you know, or like in a more interesting way. And I just felt totally paralyzed by the enormity of what we were all going through. Um, and it also felt kind of silly, like, I don't know, I just had a really hard time kind of even going back to things I had been working on before and I couldn't start anything new. I think that as the pandemic has worn on though, um, it became evident that this year was really hard for all of us, but in unique and special ways. <laughs> um, and so the kind of, I was reminded of the, yeah, singularity, I guess, of everyone's experience, but, um, but it, it took a while. It was, yeah, I wouldn't relive, I wouldn't relive last spring for anything. <laughs> Not that anyone's saying that they would, but it was definitely an intense time. Well, I had, uh, yeah, pretty similar experience with it. In the beginning was, you know, very, um, anxious and blocked actually, didn't, didn't write for a while. Then started to take, I took a couple of classes from Grub Street. That is the upside of this thing because otherwise I would never be able to take that classes. I live in Maine. Um, then which, you know, Maine is a not very diverse place to live. And that taking the class from the Grub Street was the, uh, make me exposed to all those uh, diverse writing community. And that was a great experience. And so I have been writing a lot. Uh, now it's everything's open. I hope I can keep the momentum going, um, keep fo focused and don't get distracted, you know, by all the things. 
Yes, it's so strange, like in this time of like social distancing, we've actually had these opportunities to connect with people that ordinarily we just wouldn't connect with, right? On Zoom and classes, having people from, you know, across the city, but also across the, the state, the country, and even the world. Um, but at, and at the same time, you know, I always feel like having taught, um, you know, many classes now on Zoom, on the one hand, it's, it's so exciting to have people from so many places show up. But at the same time, it's frustrating because, you know, it, there's a certain fakeness, you know, we're not really making eye contact with each other, we're not in a room together. And those are things that, you know, you can't really ignore. Um, so it's been, it's just been strange. Um, and yes, I'm sure, you know, when, we, when I go back to, um, you know, being in an in-person class again, um, I wonder what it's going to feel like, you know, um, are we going to be like, oh, this is so limiting. We're only, it's, it's only, you know, us who are in this room, we can no longer have people, you know, coming in from, from Oregon and from Singapore. Um, yeah, but we'll also be able to make eye contact again. I think an interesting part of the Zoom uh, classes, while I miss being in person as well, was the private conversation and note passing via the chat. Uh, that's been a really fun thing to learn how to do. It was like we were in high school again. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're just going to have to like go back to writing actual notes on slips of paper and passing them under the table. Another thing we get to look forward to. Um, well, thank you all so much, um, uh, all, all you readers. Uh, I know for some of you, it's your, it's, this has been your very first time reading your work aloud and you were fabulous. You were all like pros. So congratulations and, and thank you for your enthusiasm. And Julia, once more, thank you for all your help and support and um, by extension, the Boston Mayor's Office and the City of Boston for everything the city does to support local artists. Um, thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming and thank you for sharing your work with us. Thank you, yes. for organizing. Thank you for hosting thank this, you. it was fantastic, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having all of us. Yeah, it's really great. Um, I'll, I'll share the recording with um, Shuba to share back out with panelists, but um, our office will also post it on our YouTube channel. And um, if anyone's interested in learning more about our programs, you can find us at boston.gov slash arts. We have a diverse array of programs for a diverse array of artists. And we you know would love to just um, have you get to know our work a little bit better and get to know you a bit better. So. I hope I will hear from some of you um, there. Great. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening and continue to stay well.